Hello and welcome back, Sleepy What's It here, and I have another miniatures video for you. In today's video, I'll be doing the first part of a two-part series for a walkthrough slash tutorial of painting an Ultramarine Primaris Intercessor using Games Workshop's Intercessors and Paint Set. If you're not familiar with these kits, they include a beginner set of paints, a sprue of easy-to-build models, and a simple brush to get you started in the hobby. I have previously reviewed these kits as a line, so we'll put up a card now with the link for that. I'll also put the link down in uh, the description for the specific kit that we're doing in this video. If you already own some of the paints or models in this kit, it's probably not worth it to buy the entire kit just to follow along. Instead, I would recommend buying the parts that you're missing from the kit uh, to complete out, since this is probably going to be a bit cheaper. We'll go over exactly what comes in the kit in a moment. The reason I'm making these videos is that these kits are rather short on instructions. And I thought it'd be worthwhile for people beginning out in the hobby to have kind of a walkthrough to show them how to use the supplies from the kit to actually complete uh, the projects depicted on the box. I'm not going to be the best painter of the world or like uh, going to teach you how to win competitions with this kit. At best, I'm a journeyman painter, but I do know which end of the brush to hold, and I generally can paint models that I'm happy putting out on my gaming table. Hopefully I can still remember what it was like getting started out in the hobby and be able to help you avoid some of the pitfalls and things like that that I ran into when I got started. This first video will detail the contents of the box and some of the supplies that you will need that are not included in the box. This will be followed by a step-by-step -step, uh, walkthrough of building and preparing a single model from the kit. The second video in this series will be the step-by-step -step walkthrough of the actual painting process. During the walkthrough, I'll place visual markers like this to indicate that this is a point to pause in the video and work on the model on your own. I'll also include in the description timestamps for each of these steps so that you can easily jump uh, between them if you need to. The specific model that we'll be painting is the sergeant model from the kit, so it includes the same basic components that need to be painted as the other two models, as well as the exposed head. So let's get into it. Now moving on to the supplies that we'll be using. First I'll be going through the contents of the box and then mentioning some of the tools that we should have on hand that aren't included. Looking at the box briefly here, we can see the limited instructions that are provided for how to paint and assemble the models. So the first thing we have here is the gray plastic sprue with the three Primaris models on it. And next we have the starter brush that we're supplied with. This brush isn't that great, but it does get the job done for this project. These here are the three 32mm bases that we'll be placing the models on. Up next are the six pots of paints that we've been given. First here we have Abaddon Black, which will be the undercoat for the entire model. If you have an older version of this kit, you may have Imperial Primer instead. It'll do the same basic job. Next is Bugman's Glow, which is the flesh tone that we'll be using. This is followed by our metallic accent paint, uh, Balthazar Gold, which is a dark orangey gold metal color that we'll use for things like the chest emblem. Our fourth pod is McCraig Blue, which will be the primary color on these models, and what distinguishes them as Ultramarines as opposed to some other Space Marine chapter. Our penultimate pod is our shade, Agrax Earthshade. This comes in a smaller pot than you would normally be buying in a store, but it's more than enough for this project. And finally, we have our basing material, Armageddon Dust. If you don't have this paint or don't like the color of it if you're uh, putting your kit together yourself, feel free to use a different texture paste uh, for finishing off the base on these models. Now that we have covered what we're supplied with, let's discuss what's missing. So the first thing that we need is a set of plastic clippers. GW and other manufacturers produce these and they should be readily available at your friendly local game store. Up next is a bog standard hobby knife. This is available both in GW and non-GW versions. We will be using it for cleaning up the models before painting, but it shouldn't be used for uh, removing the models from the sprues. That's what the clippers are for. You may have noticed that, though there are GW-specific versions of these tools available, I'm not using them. This is because, though the GW ones are totally serviceable, I often find them to be a little bit more pricey for what they are, and tend to use other brands of them. You will need some sort of container for water that you don't mind getting gunked up with paint. I use old sour cream containers, but basically any type of vessel that holds water is fine. Then we have a standard issue piece of paper towel from the kitchen for wiping off excess paint onto. 
Uh, some people also use a kitchen sponge for this. Here we have a dry palette. This is just a surface that we can put paint on and mix it with water and things like that. GW produces palette paper for this purpose, and I know that a number of people use things like peat tile or old plates, basically any type of non-pore surface that you can uh, put paint on and you don't mind it getting paint on it should work for this. If you're looking for these, craft and art store should sell a whole bunch of these cheap plastic ones at a low price. Here's some super glue, aka CA glue, which isn't essential given that these are push fit models, but can be useful at times to ensure things are secure and not going to move around on you. As an alternative for the more advanced model maker, you do have the option of using plastic cement to fuse parts together. I personally like using this to remove seams on push fit models, but again, it shouldn't be essential that you have this. And finally, we have a painting handle. This one is the Citadel specific one. I find it actually quite ergonomic, but again, not essential that it be GW specific. But it is some, I recommend that you have something that you fix your model to so that you're not worrying about potentially touching the paint while it's still wet and just general ergonomics for working with it. A uh, common solution that people use is like something like a pill bottle or a drink lid with a blob of sticky tack on it uh, or double sided tape to stick it down. There's also a number of other manufactured options that are available. Now that we've gone over our tools, let's move on to removing the model parts from the sprue. On the sprue here, you can see that there are numbers for each of the parts. In most GW kits, there will be a set of instructions that will have graphics labeled with these numbers. These kits don't come with full instructions, but do have some instructions for a single model on the box. Once you've assembled one model, it's pretty clear uh, with what's left on the sprue, which parts go for which models though. Since we're building the sergeant model, we will need to remove pieces one through five from the sprue. When working with our sprue cutters, we want to keep the flat side of the cutters towards the piece that we are removing. As you can see here, there's a clearly notched V side, which is what we want pointing away from the model part. This is because when cutting with clippers, there will be a small pinch on the plastic that will damage it a bit, which will be happening on the notched side. So to actually cut out a piece, we're going to place the cutter flush to the model piece on the little narrow join between the piece and the sprue, and then just snip right through it. After snipping with a single join piece, it should be trivial to remove the piece, or it will actually just fall off the sprue. For multi-join pieces, we will have to cut through all of the joins uh, before we attempt to remove the piece from the frame. You should not need to twist or apply significant amounts of pressure to remove the piece. If you find that you are, I would double check that all of the cuts on the joins are all the way through. You can now pause the video while you go and cut out all the pieces for the model that we'll be building. Now that you have all the pieces of the model removed from the sprue, you can see that there's some rough patches from where you cut the joins uh, with the sprue. This is where our hobby knife comes in handy for performing cleanup. For significant masses of extra material, our hobby knife can be slid along the surface to just cut them right off. For more subtle issues, like here on the helmet, instead of cutting the material away, we can scrape uh, the edge of the knife across the surface to smooth things out a bit. When doing this, be careful to not flatten out the curved surface that you're working on. There are curved blades that can be used to make some of these situations a bit easier. Beyond the rough patches from uh, cutting away from the sprue, there may also be what are known as mold lines or flashing on the model. This is excess material on the model from non-perfect uh, fitting of the mold pieces together during the casting process. These can be removed using the same methods as before if you so desire. You may now pause the video while you go and clean up your model parts before assembly. Now that we have all the pieces cleaned up, we can start assembly. The first stage of assembly will be put the two body halves together with the head. Assembling these three pieces will probably be the most complex step of this process. The technique that I use for this is to start by loosely connecting the two halves together so that they don't fall apart, but there's still space between them to insert the head. I will then place the head into its notch and then press the two halves together. As you're pressing, you may have to adjust the head's rotation if it shifts. 
but there should be a distinct click crunch feeling when pushing as the parts uh, fit together and are fully seated. At this point, you may want to use something like plastic cement to seal the seam around the body. If you're wishing to use something like CA glue for assembling these models, I would recommend using the minimal amount necessary and not putting it into the holes that the posts are going into or on the posts themselves, but around on the surfaces that will be contacting together. This is because if you put it in the hole, uh, because of how push fit models work, there won't be any space for the liquid to escape. And what you'll actually do is prevent the push fit from closing completely. Placing the arms on these models is uh, relatively simple since there are clear posts for them to attach to. The only difficulty arises from the fact that there may be some excess material on the posts from cutting them off the sprue. You may actually have to do a little bit of extra cleanup here if you're not finding that they are fitting together correctly. Again, as before, if you're using glue or cement, make sure to not place it on the liquid directly on the poster hole, but where the arm is going to be contacting the body around the post. The final part of assembling the model itself is putting the pack onto the back of the model. Unlike with the arms, the post is actually on the pack itself, and there's a hole in the body, but it kind of goes together just like it did with the arms. Now that we have our model assembled, it needs to be placed on its base. This is done by inserting the tab at its feet into the slot on the base. With push fit models, how this tab goes into the slot is probably the weakest joint that's formed, so it kind of is easy to pull them out. So even if you're not using glue other places, this is where I'd recommend putting a little glue uh, just to make sure everything is uh, holding together. Many painters choose to partially assemble their models before painting, then finish assembly after they've completed painting. This is called subassembly painting and is done to make it easier to reach certain parts of the model during the painting process, but this is more of an advanced technique and kind of beyond the scope of what's being done in this kit. You can now pause the video and go assemble the model for yourself. Now that we have a fully assembled model, we can begin the painting process, which I'll be covering in the follow-up video to this. If everything goes correctly on my end, this follow-up video should be available the day after this video has been released. I will add a card here for that video once it has been uploaded so you can easily go to it upon completing this one. Thank you for watching. I hope that you found this video informative and enjoyable. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. You know, doing all those things that makes YouTube happy. Other than that, I look forward to seeing you in the next one.